Welcome back to Momo, Chapter 7. I hope you're enjoying listening to it. I'm enjoying reading it. Please do share it around with friends and family because I think this book has some really deep messages in it. I know it's a children's book, but it's really for everyone. It's got some messages that are very pertinent at the moment and I think can help. Um, so, are you sitting comfortably? What was that? Sorry, I can't hear you. Are you sitting comfortably? Ah, oh, it's nice to hear you. But if there's some of you out there that, that aren't actually sitting comfortably or lying comfortably or comfortable in any way, hopefully listening to this will help you to feel more comfortable. The Visitor I don't know, Momo said one day. It seems to me our odd friends come our old friends come here less and less often than they used to. I haven't seen some of them for ages. She was sitting between Guido Guide and Beppo Road Sweeper on the grass grown steps of the ruined amphitheatre watching the sun go down. Yes, Guido said pensatively. It's the same for me. Fewer and fewer people listen to my stories. It isn't like it used to be. Something's wrong. But what? said Momo. Guido shrugged, spat on the slate he'd been writing on and thoughtfully rubbed the letters out. Beppo had found the slate in the garbage can some weeks before and presented it to Momo. It wasn't a new one, of course, and it had a big crack down the middle, but it was quite usable all the same. Guido had been teaching Momo her alphabet ever since. Momo had a very good memory, so she could already read quite well, though her writing was coming on more slowly. That was like me. More slowly. Beppo, who had been pondering Momo's question, nodded and said, You're right. It's closing in. It's the same all over the city. I've noticed it for quite a long time. Noticed what? said Momo. Beto, Beppo thought a while, then he said, Nothing good. There was another pause before he added, It's getting colder. Never mind, said Guido, putting his arm consolingly around Momo's shoulder. More and more children come here anyway. Exactly, said Beppo. That's just it. What do you mean, Momo asked. Beppo thought for a long time before replying. They don't come this for the sake of our company, he said. It's refuge they're after, that's all. They looked down at the stretch of grass in the middle of the amphitheatre, where a newly invented game was in progress. The children included several of Momo's old friends, Paolo the boy who wore glasses, Maria and her little sister Rosa, Massimo, the fat boy with the squeaky voice, and Franco, the lad who always looked rather ragged and unkempt. In addition to them, however, there were a number of children who had only been coming for the past days, and one small boy who had first appeared that morning. It looked as if Guido was right. Their numbers were increasing every day. Momo would have been delighted, except that most of the newcomers had no idea how to play. All they did was sit around, looking bored and sullen, and watching Momo and her friends. Sometimes they deliberately broke up the other children's games and spoiled everything. Squabbling and scuffling with frequent, were frequent, though these never lasted long because Momo's presence had its usual effect on the newcomers too. So they soon started having bright ideas for themselves and joining in with goodwill. The trouble was, new children churned up every day. Some of them from distant parts of the city, and one spoil sport was enough to ruin the game for everyone else. But there was another thing that Momo couldn't quite understand. The thing that hap hadn't happened until recently. 
More and more often these days, children turned up with all kinds of toys she couldn't really play with. Remote controlled tanks that trun trundled to and fro, but did little else. Or space rockets that whizzed around on strings, but got nowhere. Or model robots that waddled along with eyes flashing and heads swivelling. But that was all. They were highly expensive toys, <coughs> such as Momo's friends had never owned, still less Momo herself. Most noticeable of all, they were so complete, down to the tiniest detail, that they left nothing at all for the imagination. Their owners would spend hours watching them, mesmerised, but bored. as they trundled, whizzed or waddled along. Finally, when that, pad when that paddle palled, they would go back to the familiar old games in which a couple of cardboard boxes, a torn tablecloth, a molehill or a handful of pebbles were quite sufficient to, the, to conjure up a whole world of make-believe. For some reason, this evening's game didn't seem to be going well. The children dropped out one by one until they all sat clustered around Guido, Beppo and Momo. They were hoping for a story from Guido, but that was impossible because the latest arrival had brought along a transistor radio. He was sitting a few feet away with a volume at full blast listening to commercials. Turn it down, can't you? growled Franco. The shabby-looking lad, the newcomer, pointed to the radio and shook his head. <coughs> Can't you hear? he said with an impudent grin. Turn it down, shouted Franco, rising to his feet. The newcomer paled a little but looked defiant. Nobody tells me what to do, he said. I can have my radio as loud as I like. He's right, said Beppo. We can't forbid him to make such a din. The most we can do is ask him not to. Franco sat down. Then he ought to go somewhere else, he grumbled. He's already ruined the whole afternoon. I expect he has his reason, Beppo said, studying the newcomer intently, but not unkindly for his little steel-rimmed glasses. He's sure to have. The newcomer said nothing. But moments later, he turned his radio down and looked away. Momo went over and sat down quietly beside him. He switched off the radio altogether and for a while all was still. Tell us a story, Guido, begged one of the recent arrivals. Oh yes, do, the others chimed in. The funny one. No, no, an exciting one. No, 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 a fairy tale. An adventure story. But Guido, for the first time ever, wasn't in the mood for telling stories. At length, he said, I'd far rather you told me something about yourselves and your homes, how you spend your time and why you come here. The children relapsed into silence. All of a sudden, they looked dejected and uncommunicative. We've got a nice new car, one of them said at last. On Saturday, when my mother and father have time, they wash it. If I've been good, I'm allowed to help. I want a car like that when I'm older. My parents let me go to the cinema every day, if I like, said a little girl. They don't have time to look after me, you see, and it's cheaper than babysitting. That's why I sneak off here and save the money they give me for the cinema. When I've saved up enough, I'm going to buy an aeroplane ticket and go to see the Seven Dwarves. Don't be silly, said another child. They don't exist. They do so, retorted the little girl. I've even seen pictures of them in the travel brochure. I've got eleven books on tape, said the little boy, so I can listen to them whenever I like. Once upon a time, my dad used to tell me stories when he came home from work. That was nice, 
but he's hardly ever home these days, and even when he is, he's too tired and doesn't feel like it. What about your mother, Maria? She's out all day. It's the same with us, said Maria. I'm lucky, though, having Rosa to keep me company. She, she hugged her little, the little girl on her lap and went on. When I get home from school, I heat up our supper. Then I do my homework and then she shrugged her shoulders. Then we just hang around till it gets dark. We come here usually. From the way the children nodded, it was clear that they all fared much the same. Personally, I'm glad my parents don't have time for me these days, said Franco, who didn't look glad in the least. They only quarrel when they're home and then they take it out on me. Abruptly, the boy with the transistor looked up and said, At least I get a lot more pocket money than I used to. Sure you do, sneered Paolo. The grown-ups dish out money to get rid of us. They don't like us any more. They don't even like themselves. If you ask me, they don't like anything any more. That's not true, the newcomer exclaimed angrily. My parents like me a lot. It isn't their fault not having any time to spare. It's just the way things are. They gave me this transistor to keep me company, and it cost a lot. That proves they're fond of me, doesn't it? No one spoke, and suddenly the boy, who'd been a spoil sport all afternoon, began to cry. He tried to smother his sobs and wiped his eyes with his grubby fists, but the tears flowed fast, leaving pallid snail tracks in the patches of grime on his cheeks. Other children gazed at him sympathetically or stared at the ground. They understood him now. Deep down, all of them felt as he did. They felt abandoned. Yeah, old Beppo repeated after a while. It's getting cold. I not, may not be able to come much longer, said Paolo, the boy with glasses. Mama looked surprised. Why not? My parents think you're a bunch of lazy good-for-nothings, Paolo exclaimed. They say you fritter your time away. They say there are too many of your sort around. You've got so much time on your hands. Other people have to make do with less and less. That's what they say. And if I keep coming here, I'll end up just like you. Again, there were nods of agreement from the other children who had been told much the same thing. Guido looked at, looked at each of them in turn. Is that what you think of us too? He asked. If so, why don't you? Why do you keep on coming? It was Franco who broke the sh short silence that followed. I couldn't care less. My old man says I'll end up in prison anyway. I'm on your side. I see. Guido said sadly. Do you think we're stealing time from other people? The children dropped their eyes and looked embarrassed. At length, gazing intently into Beppo's face, Paolo said, Our parents wouldn't lie to us, would they? In a low voice, he added, Aren't you time thieves, then? At that, the old road sweeper rose to his feet, but diminutive height solemnly raised his solemnly raised his right hand and declared, I have never stolen so much as a second of anyone, any person's time, so help me God. Nor have I, said Momo. Nor I, said Guido earnestly. The children pre preserved an awed silence. If the three friends had given their solemn word, that was good enough. And while we're on the subject, Guido went on, let me tell you something else. Once upon a time, people used to like coming to see Momo because she listened to them and helped them to know their own minds. If you follow my meaning, nowadays they seldom stop to wonder what they think. They used to enjoy listening to me because my stories helped them to forget their troubles, but they seldom bother with that either. They don't have time for such things, they say, but haven't you noticed something odd? It's strange. 
the things they don't have time for anymore. Guido surveyed the listening children with narrowed eyes and nodded before continuing. The other day, he said, I bumped into an old friend in town, a barber by the name of Fagaro. We hadn't met for quite a while and I hardly recognised him. He was so changed, so irritable and grumpy and depressed. He used to be cheerful type, always singing, always airing his ideas on every subject under the sun. Now, all of a sudden, he hadn't got time for anything like that. The man's just a shadow of his former self. He isn't good old Figara anymore, if you know what I mean. But now comes the really strange part. If he were the only one, I'd think he'd gone a bit cracked. But he isn't. There are people like Figaro everywhere you look. More and more of them every day. Even some of our oldest friends are going the same way. I'm beginning to wonder if it's catching. Old Beppo nodded. You're right, he said. It must be. In that case, said Momo, looking dismayed, our friends need help. They spent a long time that evening debating what to do. Of the men in grey and their ceaseless activities, none of them yet had the faintest suspicion. Momo, who couldn't wait to ask her old friends what was wrong and why they'd stopped coming to see her, spent the next few days looking them up. The first person she called on was Salvatore, the bricklayer. She knew the house well. Salvatore lived in a little garret under the roof, under the roof, but he wasn't at home. According to the other tenants, he now worked on one of the big new housing developments on the far side of town and was earning a lot of money. He seldom came home at all these days. They said when he did, it was usually in the small hours. He'd taken to the bottle and was hard to get along with. Momo decided to wait for him just the same. So she sat down on the stairs outside the door. When it grew dark, she fell asleep. It must have been long past midnight when she was woken by the sound of unsteady footsteps and raucous singing. Salvatore came blundering upstairs, caught sight of Momo and stopped short, looking dumbfounded. Momo! he said hoarsely, clearly embarrassed to be seen in his present condition. So you're still around, eh? What, what on earth are you doing here? Waiting to see you, Momo replied shyly. Uh, you're a fine one, I must say, Salvador smiled and shook his head. Fancy turning up to see your old pal, Salvador, in the middle of the night. I'd have paid you a visit myself ages ago, but I just don't have the time any more. Not for, well, personal things. He gestured vaguely and flopped down on the stair beside her. You've no idea the kind of life I leave these days. Things aren't the way they used to be. Times are changing. Over where I'm working now, everything's done in double quick time. We all work like fury. One whole floor a day. That's what we have to sling together, day after day. Yeah, it isn't like it used to be. Everything's organised, every last move we make. Momo listened closely as he rambled on, and the longer she listened, the less enthusiastic he sounded. Suddenly he lapsed into silence and massaged his face with his work-roughed hands. I've been talking rubbish, he said sadly. I'm drunk again, Momo. That's the trouble. I often get drunk these days. There's no denying it. But, but that's the only way I can stomach the thought of what we're doing over there. To be honest, bricklaying's like me. It goes against the grain. Too little cement and too much sand, if you know what I mean. Four or five years is all those buildings will last. Then they'll collapse if anyone so much as blows his nose. Shoddy workmanship from top to bottom. But that's not the worst of it. Those tenants we're putting up, putting up, aren't they? Those 
tenements we're putting up aren't places for people to live in. They're hen coops. It's enough to make you sick. Still, why should I care as long as I get my wages in the end of the week? Yeah, times are changing all right. It used to give me a kick when I built something worthwhile, but now... Some day when I've made enough money, I'm going to quit this job and do something different. He propped his chin on his hands and stared mournfully into space. Momo still said nothing, just went on listening. When Salvador spoke again, he sounded a little brighter. Maybe I should start coming to see... Maybe I should start coming to see you again and telling you my troubles. Yes, I really should. What about tomorrow or the day after? I'll have to see if I can fit it in, but I'll come, never fear. Is it a date? Momo nodded happily. Then, because they were both very tired, they said good night and she left. But Salvador never turned up, neither the next day nor the day after that. He, he never turned up at all. The next people Momo called on were Nino, the innkeeper, and his fat wife, Lelina. Their little old tavern, which had damp stained walls and a vine grown around the door, was on the outskirts of the town. Momo went around to the back, as she used to in the olden days. Through the kitchen door, which was open, she could hear Nino and Lelina quarrelling violently. Lelina, her plump face shining with sweat, was clattering pots and pans around on a stove, while Nino shouted and gest uh, gesticulated at her. The baby was lying in a basket crib in the corner, screaming. Momo sat quietly beside the baby, took it in her lap and rocked it gently to and fro until it stopped crying. The grown-ups interrupted their war of words and glanced at her dis direction. Oh, it's you, said Nino, with a ghost of a smile. Nice to see you, Momo. Hungry, Lelina inquired, rather brusquely. Momo took her he shook her head. So what do you want, Nino demanded. He sounded grumpy. We rather pressed for time just now. I only wanted to ask why it's been so long since you came to see me, Momo said softly. Nino frowned. Search me, he said irritably. I've got enough worries as it is. Yes, yeah, snapped Lelina. He certainly has. Getting rid of our regular customers, that's all he worries about these days. Remember the old men who always used to sit at the corner table in the bar, Momo? Well, he sent them packing. He chucked them out. No, I didn't, Nino protested. I asked them quite politely to take their custom elsewhere. As landlord of this inn, I was perfectly within my rights. Your rights, your rights, Lelina said angrily. You simply cannot act that way. It, it's mean and cruel. You know they'll never find another inn as easy going as ours. It wasn't as if they were disturbing anyone. There wasn't anyone to disturb, that's why, retorted Nino. No decent, well-heeled customers would patronise this place while those stubble-chinned old codgers were lolling about in the corner. Besides, they had little enough profit in one measly glass of cheap red wine, which was all they could afford in an evening. We'll never get anywhere at this rate. Lelina shrugged. We've done all right so far. So far, maybe, Nino said fiercely, but you know yourself we can't go on like this. They've just raised our rent. I've got to pay 30% more than before, and everything's getting more expensive all the time. How am I going to find the money if I, don't, if I turn this place into a home for doddling old down and outs? Why should I go easy on other people? No one's going easy on me. Lelina banged the saucepan down on the stove so hard that the lid rattled. Let me remind you something, she said, putting her hands on her mountainous hips. One of those doddering old down and outs, as you call them, is my uncle Enrico. I wouldn't have you insulting my relations. 
Enrico is a decent, respectable man, even if he doesn't have much money to splash around, like those well-heeled customers you've set your heart on. But Enrico is free to come here any time, Nino said with a lordly gesture. I told him he could stay if he wanted, but he wouldn't. Without his cronies, of course he wouldn't. What did you expect him to do, sit in the corner by himself? That settles it then, Nino shouted. In any case, I've no intention of ending my days in a small time, as a small-time innkeeper just for your uncle Enrico's benefit. I want to get somewhere in life. Is that such a crime? I aim to make a success of this place, and not just for my own sake. I'm thinking about you and the baby as well, Lelina. Don't you understand? No, I don't. Lelina said sharply, "It's being heartless is the only way you can. If being heartless is the only way you can get somewhere in life, count me out. I warn you, sooner or later I'll pack up and leave you. So suit yourself." On that note, she sh took the baby from Momo. It had started crying again and flounced out of the kitchen. Nino said nothing for a long time. He lit a cigarette and twiddled it between his fingers while Momo sat watching him. As a matter of fact, he said eventually, They were nice old boys. I was fond of them myself. I feel bad about them, Momo. But what else could I do? Times have changed, you see. His voice trailed off and it was a while before he went on. Maybe Lelina was right all along. Now that the old men don't come here any more, the atmosphere feels strange, cold somehow. I don't even like the place any more. Honestly, I honestly don't know what to do for the best. Everyone acts the same way these days. So why should I be the odd one out? He hesitated. Or do you think I should? Momo gave an almost imperceptible nod. Nina caught her eye and nodded too. Then they both smiled. I'm glad you came, Nina said. I'd quite forgotten the way we always used to say, why not go and see Momo? Well, I will come and see you again. I'll bring Lelina with me. The day after tomorrow is our day off. We'll turn up then, right? All right, said Momo, and went on her way but not before Nino had presented her with a big bag of apples and oranges. Sure enough, Nino and Lelina turned up two days later, complete with their baby and a basket full of goodies. Just imagine, Momo, said Lelina, beaming. Nino went to see Uncle Enrica and the other old men. He apologised to them one after another and asked them to come back. Nino smiled too and scratched his ear in some embarrassment. Yes, he said, and back they all came. I can say goodbye to my plans for the inn, but at least I like the place again. He chuckled and Lelina said, we'll get by, Nino. It turned out to be a lovely afternoon and before leaving they promised to come again soon. So Momo went the rounds to all her old friends. One by one she called on the carpenter who had made her little table and chairs out of packing cases and on the woman who had brought her bedstead. In short, she called on all the people whom, had listened to, whom she had lis listened to in the olden days, who thanked her, who, thanks to her, had grown wiser, happier and more self-assured although some of them failed to keep their promise to come and see her or were unable to unable to for lack of time so many old faces did turn up that things were almost as they used to be not that momo knew it she was upset in the plans of the men in grey and that they couldn't tolerate Soon afterwards, one exceptionally hot, sultry afternoon, Momo came across a doll on the steps of the old amphitheatre. It wasn't uncommon for children to forget all about their expensive toys they couldn't really play with and leave them behind by mistake, but Momo had no recollection of seeing such a doll, and she would certainly have noticed it because it was very unusual one. 
nearly as tall as Momo herself. The dog, the doll, was so lifelike that it might also have been mistaken for a miniature human being, though not a child or a baby. Its red mini, mini dress and high heel sandals made it look more like a shop window dummy or a stylish young woman about town. Momo stared at it, fascinated. After a while, she put out her hand and touched it. Instantly, the doll blinked a couple of times, opened its rosebud mouth and said in a metallic voice that sounded as if it were issuing from a telephone, Hello, I'm Lola, the living doll. Momo jumped back in alarm. Then automatically, she replied, Hello, I'm Momo. The doll's lips moved again. I belong to you, it said. All the other kids envy you because I'm yours. You are mine, Momo said. Someone must have left you uh, here by mistake. She picked the doll up again. The lips moved. I'd like some nice things, said the metallic voice. Would you, Momo thought for a minute. I doubt if I've got anything you'd care for, but you're welcome to look. Still holding the doll, Momo clambered through the hole in the wall that led to her underground room. All her most treasured possessions were in the box beneath the bed. She pulled it out and lifted the lid. Here, she said, this is all I've got. If you'd like anything, just tell me. And she showed the doll a colourful bird's feather, a pebble with pretty streaks in it, a brass button and a fragment of coloured glass. The doll said nothing, so so she nudged it. Hello, I'm Lola, the living doll. I know, said Momo, but you told me you wanted something. How about this lovely pink seashell? Would you like it? I belong to you, the doll replied. All the other kids envy you because I'm yours. You told me that too, said Momo. All right, if you don't want any of my things, perhaps we could play a game together, shall we? I'd like some nice things, the doll repeated. I don't have anything else, Momo said. She shook the dolls and climbed back outside again. Then she put Lola, the living doll, on the ground and sat down facing her. Let's pretend you've come to pay me a visit, Momo suggested. Hello, said the doll. I'm Lola, the living doll. How nice of you to call, Momo replied politely. Have you come far? I belong to you, the doll said. All the other kids envy you because I'm yours. Look, said Momo, we'll never get anywhere if you go on repeating yourself like this. I'd like something nice. I'd like some nice new things, said the doll, fluttering its eyelashes. Momo tried several games in turn, but nothing came of them. If only the doll had remained silent, she could have supplied the answers herself and held an interesting conversation with it. As it was, the very fact that it could talk made conversation impossible. Before long, Momo was overcome by a sensation entirely new to her that she took quite that she took that she took quite a while to recognise as plain boredom. Although her inclination was to abandon Lola, the living doll, and play some other game, she couldn't, for some reason, tear herself away. So there she sat, gazing at the doll, and the doll with its glassy blue eyes fixed on hers gazed back. It was as if they had hypnotised each other. When, at long last... Momo did manage to drag her eyes away from the doll. She gave a little start of surprise. Parked close by, but not that she'd heard it drive up, stood a smart grey car. In it sat a man wearing a suit as grey as a spider's web, a stiff round bowler hat of the, of the same colour on his head. He was smoking a small grey cigar and his face too was as grey as ashes. He must have been watching Momo for some time because he nodded and smiled at her and although the day was so hot that the air was dancing in the sunlight, Momo suddenly began to shiver. 
The man opened the car door and came over, carrying a grey steely briefcase. What a lovely doll you have there, he said in a particularly flat and expressionless voice. It must be the envy of all your playmates. Momo just shrugged and said nothing. I'll bet it cost a fortune, the man in grey went on. I wouldn't know, Momo mumbled, feeling rather embarrassed. I found it lying around. Well, I never, the man in grey, said the man in grey. You're a lucky girl, no mistake. Momo remained silent and hugged her baggy jacket slightly to her. It was growing colder and colder. All the same, said the all the same, said the man in grey with a thin-lipped smile. You don't seem too pleased. Momo shook her head. She suddenly felt as if ha happiness had fled the world forever, or rather as if happiness had never existed, and all her ideas of it had merely had had been merely figments of her own imagination. At the same time, she had a... a <laughs> presentiment of danger. I've been watching you for a while, pursued the man in grey. From what I've seen, you don't have the first idea how to play with such a marvellous doll. Shall I show you? Momo stared at him in surprise and nodded. I'd like some nice new things, the doll squawked suddenly. You see, said the man in grey. She's actually telling you herself. You can't play with a marvellous doll like this, the way that you play with any old doll. That's obvious. Anyway, it isn't what she's meant for. If you don't want to get bored with her, you have to give her things. Look here. He went back to the car and opened the boot. In the first, in the first place, he said, she needs plenty of clothes. Like this gorgeous evening gown, for instance. He pulled out a gown and tossed it at Momo. And here's a genuine mink coat, and a tennis dress, and a skiing outfit, and a swimsuit, and a riding habit, and some pyjamas, and a nightie, another dress, another, and another, and another, and another. One by one he tossed them out till they formed a huge heap on the ground between Momo and the doll. There, he said, with another thin smile. That should keep her happy for a while, shouldn't it? Or are you going to get bored again after a couple of days? Very well, you'll just have to have some more nice things for your doll. He reached inside the boot again. Here, for instance, is a real little snakeskin purse with a real little lipstick and a powder compact inside. Here's a miniature camera and a tennis racket and a doll's TV set that really works. Here's a bracelet and necklace, some earrings, a doll's gold-plated automatic, some... Uh, silk stockings, a feather boa, a straw hat, an Easter bonnet, some miniature golf clubs, a little checkbook, perfume, bath salts, body lotion. He broke off and glanced keenly at Momo, who was sitting amid this clutter of toys with a stunned expression on her face. You see, he said, it's quite simple. As long as you go on getting more and more things, you'll never grow bored. I know what you're going to say. Sooner or later, Lolo will have everything, and then I'll be bored again. Well, there's no fear of that. Here we have the perfect boyfriend for Lola. This time, when he reached into the boat, into the boot, he produced a boy doll. It was the same size as Lola and just as lifelike. Look, he said, it's a butch. He has any number of nice things too, and when you get bored with him, we can supply a girlfriend for Lola with masses of outfits that won't fit any anyone but her. Butch has a friend too, and his friend has friends of his own, and so on ad infinitum. 
So you see, ne so you see, you never need get bored because the games can go on forever. There's always something left to wish for. As he spoke, the man in grey took doll after doll from the boot, whose contents seemed inexhaustible. Momo continued to sit there watching him rather apprehensively while he arrayed them on the ground beside her. Well, he said at length, expelling a dense cloud of smoke from his cigar. Now do you see how to play with dolls like these? Yes, said Momo, who was positively shaking with cold. Satisfied, the man in grey nodded and took another doll another pull at his cigar. You'd like to keep all of these nice things, wouldn't you? Of course I would. Very well. I'll make you a present of them. You can have them. Not all at once, of course, but one at a time, and lots of other things as well. You don't have to do anything in return. Just play with them the way I've shown you. What do you say? He fixed Momo with an expectant smile. Then, when she still said nothing, just returned his gaze without smiling back, he went on quickly, You won't need your friends any more. Don't you see? You'll have quite enough to amuse you when all these lovely things are yours and you keep on getting more and more, won't you? You'd like that, wouldn't you? Surely you want these marvellous dolls. I'll bet you already set your heart on it. Momo dimly sensed that she had to fight on she had a fight on her hands, indeed that she was already in the thick of the fray, but she didn't know why she was fighting or with whom. The longer she listened to this stranger, the more she felt she had felt the more she felt as she had felt with the doll. She could hear a voice speaking and hear the words it uttered, but she couldn't tell who was actually saying them. She shook her head. What? exclaimed the man in grey, raising his eyebrows. You modern children are never satisfied, honestly. Lola's perfect in every detail. If there's anything wrong with her, Perhaps you'd care to tell me. Momo stared at the ground and fought hard. Then she said quite quietly, I don't think anyone could love it. Her, I mean. The man in grey didn't answer for a time. He stared into space with eyes as glassy as the dolls. At last he pulled himself together. That's not the point, he said coldly. Momo met his eyes. What scared her most about him was the icy chill that seemed to emanate from his body. Yet in some strange way, she couldn't have said why, she felt sorry for him as well as scared. But I do love my friends, she said. The man in grey grimaced as if he'd bitten into a lemon, but he quickly recovered his com uh, composure and and gave her a razor sharp smile. Momo, he said smoothly, I think we should have a serious talk, you and I. It's time you learned what matters in life. He produced a little grey notebook from his pocket and leafed through it until he found what he was looking for. Your name is Momo, isn't it? Momo nodded. The man in grey shut his notebook with a snap and pocketed it again. Then, with a faint grunt of exertion, he sat himself down on the ground at Momo's side. He sat no more. He sat. He said no more for a while, just puffed thoughtfully at his small grey cigar. All right, Momo, he said at last. Listen carefully. Momo had been trying to do this all the time, but the man in grey was far harder to listen to than anyone she'd ever heard. She could understand what other people meant and what they were like by getting right inside them, so to speak. But with him, 
this was quite impossible. Whenever she tried to read his thoughts, she seemed to plunge headlong into a dark chasm, as if there were nothing there at all. It had never happened to her before. All that mattered in life, all that matters in life, the man in grey went on, is to climb the ladder of success, amount to something, own something. When a person climbs higher and higher than the rest, am amounts to more, owns more things, everything else comes automatically. Friendship, love, respect, everything. You tell me your love, you tell me you love your friends. Let's examine that statement quite objectively. He blew a few smoke rings. Momo tucked her feet under her skirt and burrowed deep into her oversized jacket. The first question to consider, pursued the man in grey, is how much your friends really gain from the fact of your existence. Are you any practical use to them? No. Do you help them to get on in the world, make more money, make something of their lives? No, again. Do you assist them in their efforts to save time? On the contrary, you distract them. You're a milestone around their necks, an obstacle to their progress. You may not realise it, Momo, but you harm your friends by simply being here. Without meaning to, you're really their enemy. Is that what you call love? Momo didn't know what to say. She'd never looked at things that way. She even wondered for one brief moment whether the man in grey might not be right after all. And that, he went on, is why we want to protect your friends from you. If you really love them, you'll help us. We have their interest at heart, so we want them to succeed in life. We can't just look on idly while you distract them from everything that matters. We want to make sure you leave them alone. That's why we're giving you all these lovely things. Momo's lips had begun to tremble. Who's we? she asked. The time-saving bank, said the man in grey. I'm Agent BLW553C. I wish you no harm, personally speaking, but the time-saving bank isn't an organisation to be trifled with. Just then, Momo recalled what Beppo and Guido had said about time-saving being infectious, and she had an awful suspicion that this stranger had something to do with the spread of the epidemic. She wished from the bottom of her heart that her friends were with her now. She had never felt so alone, but she was determined not to let fear get the better of her. Summoning up all her courage, she plunged, headlong into the dark chasm in which the stranger concealed his true self. He had been watching her out of the corner of his eye, so the change in her expression did not escape him. He lit a fresh cigar from the butt of the old one. Don't bother, he said with a sarcastic smile. You're no match for us. But Momo stood firm. Isn't there anyone who loves you? she whispered. The man in grey squirmed a little. I must say, he replied in his greyish voice, I've never met anyone like you before. Truly I haven't, and I've met a lot of people in my time. If there were many more like you around, we'd have nothing left to live on. We'd have to close down the time-saving bank and dissolve into thin air. He broke off, staring at Momo as if she were something he could neither understand nor cope with. His face turned a shade greyer. When next he spoke, it was as if he were doing it against his will, as if the words were pouring forth despite him. At the same time, his face became more and more convulsed with horror at what was happening to him. 
At long last, Momo heard his real voice, which seemed to come from infinitely far away. We have to remain unrecognised, he blurted out. No one must know of our existence or our activities. We make sure no one ever remembers us, because we can only carry on our business if we pass on unnoticed. It's a wearisome business too, bleeding people of their time by the hour, minute and second. All the time they save, they lose to us. We drain it off, we hoard it, we thirst for it. The human beings have no conception of the value of their time, but we do. We suck them dry. We need more and more time every day because there are more and more of us. More and more and more. The last few words were uttered in a sort of death rattle. The man in grey clapped his hands over his mouth and stared at Momo with his eyes bulging. Little by little he seemed to emerge from a kind of trance. What happened? he stammered. You've been spying on me. I'm ill. It's all your fault. His tone became almost imploring. I've been talking nonsense, Momo. Forget it. Forget like me. Forget like everyone else. You must. You must. He grabbed hold of Momo and shook her. Her lips moved, but she couldn't get a word out. The man in grey jumped to his feet. He peered in all directions like a cornered beast, then snatched up his briefcase and, spin and sprinted to the car. The next moment, something very strange happened. Like an explosion in reverse, all the dolls and their scattered belongings flew back into the boot, which slammed shut. The car roared off at such a speed that grit and pebbles spurted from its wheels. Momo sat there for a long time, trying to make sense of what she had heard. As the dreadful chill seeped slowly through her limbs, so her thoughts became steadily clearer. Now that she had heard the real voice of the man in grey, she could remember everything. From the sun-baked grass in front of her rose a slender thread of smoke. The trampled butt of a small grey cigar was smouldering away to ashes. Seems quite scary at the moment. That's the end of chapter seven. Join me again for chapter eight. I think it's got some really good messages in it. Hope you're enjoying. Loads of love to you, and remember, keep connected. It will help us through these difficult times. Yes. Don't sell your time to this time-saving bank.